Every week, one million people around the world move to a city. In some countries, like China, sprawling megalopolis are on the verge of a demographical implosion. At this frantic pace, the number of city dwellers will go from 3.6 billion to 6.3 billion by 2050. Cities are only 2% of the crust of the planet, but they're 50% of the population, actually now a little bit more than 50%. The world is urbanizing at an unprecedented rate. A lot of the massive urbanizing of populations has to do with people having been thrown out from wherever they were in the countryside. Survival. If you're thrown off your farm, where do you go? You go to a city. China is now the spearhead for global urbanization. It's China first and foremost. For better or worse, it is China that is paving the way for all those countries that are going to see a huge rural exodus and accelerated economic development. For instance, India and more likely Africa. The main problems are the supply of water, the supply of food, clean air, excessive pollution and the extraordinary cows that comes from trucks and cars and people bringing in the food, taking out the food, whatever it might be. But the biggest challenge is how we're misusing our own energies. Cities are 75% of energy consumption and 80% of CO2 emissions. Because so much energy and so much people are concentrated on cities, that's why it's very important that we address this challenge at the city level. If we can do something important at the city level, then the impact will be global. To respond to this energy crisis and the explosion of the global urban population, new cities are emerging around the world. Futuristic cities created from scratch. In South Korea, China and Saudi Arabia, in Abu Dhabi, and in Russia, cities of a new kind are now under construction. These are prototypes of green, hyper-connected cities that are stuffed with digital technology and ecological equipment. Their designers present them as living laboratories of the future, as ideal cities. But are these cities really efficient? Are they really livable? Or are they just new urban utopias that are doomed to failure? For an architect or an engineer, designing a new city from a blank sheet of paper is a little like playing Sim City in the real world, the celebrated video game in which one creates and manages one's own city. And this is a relatively recent idea. Since Roman times, planning a city or building a city has been a bottom-up process where very basic infrastructure was provided. Just, you know, a network of streets and the size of the city. But then everybody would actually use it as a way to build up its own parcel with many people doing small additions and really creating a bigger thing from many individual moves. And that has created incredible richness. The idea to design a city from scratch in a top-down way is a relatively recent idea. And this idea actually emerges at one point because we need to build so much urban fabric. But this is also something that played into this kind of Promethean myth of the architect, or somebody who with a single hand can actually change a whole city. In the 20th century, you can think about cities like Chandigarh in India, designed by Le Corbusier, or cities like Brasilia. Brasilia is a beautiful city, if you look at it from an airplane. Actually, the city itself looks like an airplane. But in the end, one limit, of course, is that you create something very rigid that uh, um, cannot evolve easily. New cities have often failed in the past, like mirages. But the dream to build them has never gone away. And those futuristic cities under construction right now have been designed by people who are determined to succeed. In November 2013, 150 of them came together in Saudi Arabia, in King Abdullah Economic City, a city that has emerged from the desert on the edge of the Red Sea. It is here where the first international forum for new cities is taking place, 
with a title that describes a program, City Quest. Over the next two days, we will be hearing from the builders of the most ambitious new cities in the world. Urban laboratory of King Abdullah Economic City really grounds this debate in reality. So we are particularly excited to have this discussion here that will address the key challenges and opportunities that face the builders of these new cities and their partners. If you're building a city from scratch, you have the advantage of leapfrogging. You don't have installed base. You know, my boss, Wim Elfrink, says God created world in six days and then rested on the seventh because he had no installed base. When you have installed base, it's difficult to redo things. So that's why it's more challenging in a London or in Paris or in Bombay or in Shanghai. However, when you're starting from a city, from, from scratch, yes, you do have the advantage that you can leapfrog and you can build it in. But you also have the disadvantages that you don't have an identity. You don't have, an, you know, you don't have the base. People don't know who you are. You have to build that, and that takes time. King Abdullah Economic City is still almost deserted today. Fewer than 300 families live here. The project for this economic city was launched in 2005 by King Abdullah and won't be finished until 2035. The master plan is impressive. What you see in front of you is the uh, model for the, um, the original master plan of King Abdullah Economic City. The total area of King Abdullah Economic City is around 180 million square meters, so uh, almost the size of Washington, D.C. Welcome to a city that embraces the future. The city will have six distinct components. The seaport, an international transshipment hub, the industrial zone, the resort area, the education zone, the central business district, the residential area. The point about the separation of activities is very, very important. You know, again, if you take Le Corbusier and uh, the Chartes d'Athènes, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the idea was that you had to divide everything. You had to have a city where actually living would be different than working, would be different than leisure, and then you would have connections between all these different parts. It was a response to the factory culture where actually you had to start with a production neighborhood and then everything would rotate around it. And so, in a certain sense, it's a huge waste. We know that actually mixing uses is very important. Some of that we still have to do. You have to separate industry from residential areas because of environmental reasons. You know, nobody wants to live next to a uh, chimney or next to any kind of polluting industry. Having said that, I think we also are trying to connect the workplace was the place you know, to live and the place to, to, to play and enjoy on the weekend. So we are trying to minimize the commute by mixing commercial and residential areas as much as we can. Designing a city from scratch allows the designers to think freely about the mix of activities, to limit the need to travel, and to avoid wasting energy and time. Futuristic cities also often aim to become hub cities, key centers within the large global network. This is particularly true in Songdo in South Korea. This spectacular business city project emerges over six square kilometers of dried out land reclaimed from the Yellow Sea. The construction of Songdo was initiated in 2001 by the South Korean authorities. And to attract foreign businesses, it was located in the Incheon Free Economic Zone, around 60 kilometers from Seoul. Our primary aim was to have a lot of foreigners come to do business here, to have a foreign population and a city that was favorable for doing business. And the thing that made up our minds, the thing that ensured it had potential, was Incheon International Airport, that is right inside the free economic zone. Around 30% of the global population, around 1.5 billion people, live within three hours of Incheon International. This project for an airport city 
and Aerotropolis, midway between China and Japan, will be able to house 65,000 people by the time it is completed in 2020. So far, a little over 20,000 have settled here. Before moving to Songdo, I lived near Seoul. I moved here around two and a half years ago. I came because of my husband. Firstly, because he teaches at Incheon University, but mainly because he's Canadian. Because he is Canadian, I suspected he'd need to be traveling often. So we decided to come and live here near the airport. We're just 20 minutes away. It's a 20-minute bus ride. So you have the feeling that Canada is not as far away. And also, my sister lives in Beijing, in China. To attract people to this city with no past, Songdo's designers were inspired by the urban landscapes of some famous cities around the world. The Neat Tower, the highest building in South Korea at 305 meters, looks like the new World Trade Center in New York. The International Convention Center was directly inspired by the Sydney Opera House. These emblematic buildings were designed by New York architects KPF, who drew up the master plan for the city. We have designed and built 40% of the world's tallest buildings. New Songdo City, it's a patchwork, a collage of many different kinds of urban uh, building and urban planning. For example, uh, the canals of Amsterdam, and then for the larger park. As a model, we came mostly to Central Park in New York because it's a very interesting compact zone where one feels that there's a kind of infinity of space. And it becomes the heart of the city. It's the heart, or you could say it's the lungs of the city because it is the green space. Green areas and cities, of course, help to reduce the heat sink, the heat island effect of uh, buildings both producing and absorbing heat. And green creates cool zones. Uh, it processes uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen, re reverse flow of, of our carbon footprint. That's important. Songdo is a Western-style city where green spaces account for 40% of the city area. The environment is a very important consideration for cities of the future. It is about both improving the quality of life of the urban dwellers and reducing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is higher today than it has been over the past 2.5 million years. This issue is particularly sensitive in China, which is now the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gas and which is currently developing dozens of projects for eco-cities. The biggest construction site is in Tianjin, 150 kilometers south of Beijing. Since 2007, the Chinese and Singaporean governments have joined forces to build Tianjin Eco City from scratch, a pilot eco city that has been designed to welcome 350,000 inhabitants by 2020 in an area of 30 square kilometers. This area was chosen because it's non farm land, it's lacking in fresh water. So the idea is that if even in such harsh conditions we can build an eco city, then this is a model that can be replicated elsewhere. There used to be a polluted sewage pond in this area. It let off a bad smell and people didn't want to be anywhere near it. But this area in the past five years has now been transformed. The water has been treated and it is now a lake where the water is safe for water sports. It is called Qingxing Lake or Peaceful Lake. One of the goals of the Eco City is to allow residents to enjoy more green spaces than in other similar cities in northern China. The target we aim to reach is 12 square meters of green space per person. Today, 20% of the project has been completed, and there are only 6,000 inhabitants in Tianjin Eco City so far. 
We moved here in November, around one month ago. If we have children, it will be great here because it's a great environment. And also, we expect a lot from this city for the future. I think a lot of good things are going to happen here. We've lived in the Echo City for two years. The main reason we came was our daughter. We wanted her to live in a healthy environment. I'm very, very happy to live here because of the green spaces. I love green and the color of blossoming flowers. I also love watching birds fly in the sky. You can't see them elsewhere because there is too much pollution. That's why I really like living here. Tianjin Eco City aims to become a model for an ecological city. It is a huge project with a budget of nearly 30 billion euros. The construction of these new cities represents colossal investments, which are often based on public-private partnerships between governments and enterprises. The problem is that the public sector hasn't got the money. It requires 60,000 billion euros or dollars of infrastructure investment and in terms of public finances, there's only 3,000 available. So 57,000 billion euros are missing, which is huge. So of course the private sector has to get involved. Here in King Abdallah Economic City, the strategy was mainly driven by the Saudi state, but the construction of the city is being carried out by private companies. The giant Imar Properties is driving operations. It is one of the two main real estate businesses in Dubai, and the budget is pharaonic. Well, it'll cost $100 billion to build a city. Never in the history of the world has a city of this size been fully privatized. One of the main objectives is to diversify the Saudi economy away from oil. We have 25% of the global oil reserves. Uh, but only 2% of the global energy-dependent industries. Uh, and we need to change that. The key economic sectors we're trying to establish in uh, King Abdullah Economic City is to make it a global logistics hub by creating a mega port. We have attracted 60 um, global and local companies, and the long-term objective is to have 2 million people in the city and 1 million jobs. In South Korea, the construction of Songdo has also been entirely financed by the private sector, by a consortium of South Korean and American companies. Real estate promoter Gale International is responsible for developing the center of the city. This is an enormous project involving apartments, offices, retail developments, schools, and hotels. As you see from my bedroom, <laughs> I get the opportunity to stare and see the level of progress of completing the knee tower every day, and I enjoy it and watch the city being built. I also see a lot of unfulfilled areas that we need to complete and populate. We think about 35 billion will be the full build out. Now that would include the entire build out of which we're about at the 50% mark uh, now, and the interior build out that goes along with a smart and connected city. New cities like Songdo are designed like laboratories of the future. They are pilot cities where specialists in new technologies get to try out their latest innovations in terms of so-called smart cities on a life-size blank canvas. Cities that use IT and communication technologies to optimize urban networks and resources. Today, at the rate at which we're consuming energy, within the next uh, by 2040 or 2050, you need, the, you need five Earths to support this one Earth of population. And that's just not going to happen. I tell that the future great cities and smart cities will not look any different than the cities that they look now, but it'll be managed differently. It'll be run differently. People will live there differently. They'll be more globally connected. When we talk about smart cities and when we talk about technology, it is to address issues like how do I increase the utilization of resources? For example, in a building like this, 
there are 75 to 85 protocols, but they don't talk to each other. HVAC system doesn't talk to your lighting. Lighting doesn't talk to the fire. Fire doesn't talk to the networks. If you integrate that, you can lower the cost of energy by 30 to 40 percent. And in a city, if you can lower your cost of energy by 30 to 40 percent, that's a huge impact on the city budget. Along with Cisco and other tech companies, the South Koreans made Songdo the first U city in the world, a ubiquitous city where everything is connected. Millions of sensors are installed in all the infrastructures and in all the buildings. These are linked to a central computer, which manages most of the services in the city to make it the most efficient possible. All the data are collected, and most are treated automatically in a control center straight out of a science fiction film. You could call this the brain of the U-City, the central nervous system where everything is connected. The U-City concept brings together a lot of data about the city, including videos, sensor data, weather information, traffic info, criminal prevention information, breaking and entering. All this information is interlinked, so it's a very complex structure. The city can respond much better to what happens in real time. If you had to win a Formula One race 10, 15 years ago, you needed a good driver and a good car. The physical infrastructure was vital. But today, if you want to win a Formula One race, actually, you also need a system of telemetry. Thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, collecting information in real time, sending it wirelessly to computers where information is analyzed, is processed, and decisions are made in real time. The real-time control system becomes vital for winning the race. And if you want, what is happening today, the city scale is the same. It's actually sensing and actuating, and our cities become a little bit like that Formula One racing car. Today's cities are caught up in a race against the clock to deal with the depletion of fossil fuels and rising greenhouse gas emissions, which are responsible for climate change. New cities attempt to rise to this challenge as best they can by constructing control centers that allow them to save their resources and by developing more and more green energy. In China, Tianjin Eco City has an objective to use 20% renewable energies by 2020. We installed the five wind turbines behind me in Tianjin Eco City at the end of 2011 as part of a project to harness wind power for electricity. The total production capacity of the project is 4.5 megawatts. The total electricity production must cover the annual electricity consumption of 2,000 households in the city. Because Tianjin isn't very exposed to the wind, among the renewable energy sources used here, the proportion of geothermic and solar energy is higher. The big problem with renewable energies like solar or wind power is that they are intermittent energies. The sun doesn't always shine, and the wind doesn't always blow. And today, there's no miracle technique to capture and store enough renewable energy to completely replace fossil fuels. That's why Tianjin Eco City, like Songdo, gets most of its electricity from a power station. But it is more environmentally friendly than a traditional power station because it uses LNG, or liquefied natural gas, which emits much less CO2 than conventional gas and other fossil fuels. Right from the design of the power station, we decided to only produce electricity using LNG. You could say that there is virtually nothing in that gas that is toxic for the environment. And for the combustion of the gas, we also opted to use low NOx burners that have low nitrogen oxide emissions. The vapor produced by the gas turbines when generating electricity isn't wasted into the air. The heat is used to reheat water used in the city network. The technologies used in the city allow it to reduce its energy footprint, and they are not limited to public infrastructure. They are also used in housing blocks and apartments, which are all equipped with smart meters. 
Here we can see our gas consumption, the security, the heating, water, electricity. We can see all of that. In red is what our household is using, and in green is the average use of the other households in the building. In November, the others only use that. But we use too much. And because we use too much, we feel we have to reduce it. Thanks to these functions, I've been able to make savings in terms of electricity, water and heating. Compared to my previous apartment, I can save between 30 to 40 percent. There is even a competition for ideas on how to reduce consumption. And the one who uses the least gets a prize from the property management company. The prize is a month's free entrance to the fitness center in the basement. There's even this. <laughs> Thanks to these smart meters, the residents can reduce their consumption. The city agents, in turn, can optimize use of the resources. They can know in real time how much energy each building is using, and thus adapt production to meet consumption and redirect energy between the buildings. This smart resource management is also applied to the city's water network. It's important to react quickly if there's a water leak. So each pipe is fitted with a sensor that monitors the pressure of the flow. When the flow is very low, that indicates a risk of leakage. So we send a message to the Directorate of Technical Services or to the appropriate body so they can check it out as quickly as possible. One third of the water resources of global cities, by the way, is wasted through pipes. So we're, we're trying to um, think um, uh, more cleverly about how to protect our water assets through conservation of use, but also through, um, through um, our piping methodologies. And um, you'll have the desalination plants that will desalinate for fresh water. In Saudi, we have to think about sustainability in water because we have so little of it. While the planet's drinking water supplies are shrinking radically with the unbridled development of human activity, the developers of new cities are doing all they can to limit the use of this precious resource as much as possible. Annual rainfall in South Korea is 1,500 millimeters. The rainfall is concentrated in the summer months, from July to September. So this is a water-stressed country. This canal is 1.8 kilometers long and around 1.5 meters deep. This is desalinated seawater. And we have a system that recycles part of our wastewater, 40% which is recycled. We supply around 3,000 tons of water per day. That means we save around 3,000 tons of water. The water we recycle is used for flushing lavatories, cleaning streets, or for landscaping and parks, for example. There are a lot of parks, and we also supply the water for the lake. There are 22.3 kilometers of pipes in total, measuring 250 or 400 millimeters in diameter. And that forms a kind of spider web. It's hard to create this kind of system in existing cities because of the pipes already in place. In the south of China, near Changsha, the Lake Yang EcoCity has built a pilot station for wastewater recycling that is even more innovative than the one in Songdo. It uses aquatic plants to eliminate the micropollutants that can be found in water recycled by traditional treatment plants. These are artificial humid zones from the wastewater recycling plant at Lake Yang City. The total surface area is 8 hectares and we have planted 20 different kinds of aquatic plant. These plants are our wastewater recycling machines. As they grow, the plants absorb particles of nitrogen and phosphorus, 
When the water flows through this gravel, it filters, settles, absorbs and exchanges the ions, etc. These are chemical physical principles. We chose this method because it is very important for an ecological town. The artificial humid zones allow us to save a great deal of energy. The system uses no electricity at all. The water is very clear. It's the highest norm for recycled water in China. This is the water that arrives in the wastewater plant of Lake Yang City. This is the intermediary stage, water treated by the industrial method, and this is the final stage, once the water is treated by the artificial humid zones. After two or three years behind us, we think that with the process of urbanization of the country, many more new places should be able to use our concept. Preserving natural resources is a major priority for new cities. The other priority is transportation. These cities of the future want to put an end to countless problems caused by the automobile civilization, pollution, traffic, and accidents, among others. As a result, they favor other modes of transport, such as bicycles, water taxis, or walking, by developing specific networks that have been thought out ahead of time, right from the moment the city was designed. The Koreans have a love affair with the automobile that parallels the Americans. And uh, part of our goal in New Songdo City is to reduce that dependency and, and shrink the need for constant traffic. It's a compact city you shouldn't need uh, because of the radii of walking and of bus transport and of bicycle lanes, etc. You should not need to use a car at all in the city. You should have, uh, will have freedom to get anywhere within five or 10 minutes uh, in a healthy walk uh, or a bus ride. That's one of the advantages of, of designing a city from scratch, that it's, it's the network, it's the standard of distances, it's the basic underlying order that one can tune to something as simple but as important as bicycle traffic. Songdo has a total of 25 kilometers of bicycle paths. New cities are promoting means of transport that don't produce CO2 emissions, and they all use IT and communication technologies to optimize flow management. We have cameras and sensors on the ground to track the speed of cars and monitor traffic jams in real time. With this data, we can automatically regulate traffic lights. In zones where there are traffic jams, the lights are left green for longer. Where traffic is flowing more fluidly, the lights turn red. That allows us to encourage the traffic to flow better. Then when something unexpected, such as an accident occurs, we immediately share the information via driver's smartphones and traffic signs, so that people can avoid the problem area. In terms of areas where parking is forbidden, if a car parks there, a camera automatically detects it and sends the information to the control center. The automatic system sends a fine directly to the driver's home. Because the traffic flows in Songdo, the city uses less energy and emits fewer greenhouse gases. And to lighten the traffic even further, the engineers have removed the need for garbage trucks. Waste is collected in pneumatic trash cans and a vast underground network of pipes. Swept up with the smash hit by South Korean singer Psy, Songdo was awarded a very symbolic reward in 2013. It won an international competition, beating cities including Bonn and Geneva to become the home to the headquarters of the Green Climate Fund, a new United Nations agency responsible for managing aid for developing countries to fight against climate change. One. Two, three. 
당장 행동에 나서야 하는 오늘의 문제입니다. 온실가스가 지금의 추소, 추세로 계속 배출될 경우 금세기 말에는 지구 온도가 평균 3.7도씨 상승하고 앞으로 녹색기후기금이 기후변화 대응의 핵심 기구로 성장해 나가기를 기대하고 있습니다. Songdo's bet has paid off. It has earned its status as a model for a green city. But are these new cities filled with sensors and computers really ideal cities as their designers would have one believe? Are they really modern utopias that are becoming a reality? When you think about smart cities and you ask yourself, well, what's the biggest risk on paper or on the screen? They look like they have thought through everything. That everything can be controlled, often by a firm. So if you make all these buildings pregnant with technical systems that run everything, and you think that the rate of obsolescence of those systems is very different from the stones with which that building was made, then you have a problem. One of the risks is that our cities are becoming like computers in open air. Our cars are becoming like computers on wheel. Well, we all know what happens when our computer gets a virus and crashes. But what if your city or your car gets a virus and crashes? Of course, these are vulnerable places, so they are potential points of attack for soldiers, for terrorists, or for strictly financial purposes in a context of criminal behavior and theft. It's obvious. It's going to happen. There's always going to be the so-called non-state sponsored terrorists, right? The, the hackers who are going to come in and you'll get... It, it is, it is the, it's going to be the rule of the, the future. I don't think you'll ever get to a stage where it'll be there will be no, no bugs, that there will be no uh, errors. But I think the fail-safe systems will come into play that says, uh, you know, we'll detect it and we'll interpret it. So we have to build redundancies, we have to build the securities, and it is a top priority not only for Cisco, but for IBMs of the world and for cities and governments. For tech companies, the city is often reduced to a series of problems that are just waiting to be resolved through their software and their networks. They are fighting over the very lucrative market that is smart cities, and think of these new cities as technological showrooms. It's a business. Right now we have a business of making cities, and these businesses are increasingly interested in selling you whole cities that they then keep the kindly way of putting it is servicing. That's then an ongoing source of revenue. There is money to be made, but the monetization of big data is not very clear. Lots, the, of, money. lots of money to be made. If you, in fact, lots of money. What I'm saying is that the target that I gave the company in 2017, I'm gonna cover at the end of this year. The market uh, for smart cities, it's at least $400 billion. So it's a huge market. I think uh, when you consider just the population growth, when you consider the migration of people from rural areas to, you know, just in India and China alone, 800 million people will move in the next 20 years, 800 million. And all of these cities have to be built quickly. They don't have the time span of 100 years to build a London or 100 years to build a Philadelphia. You have to do it in eight, 10 years. And to do it in eight, 10 years, you better think in terms of replicable models. But that doesn't mean all cities will look the same, but the principles should be similar. The whole idea that Stan has is how do you build a city in a box so that you can scale and replicable very quickly. So he's taken all his ideas and he's put it into concept idea and then he sold that. But now uh, we've had visitors from over 50 cities, many from China, from India and around the world. And I had to stop the visitors from coming. We couldn't get any work done here. <laughs> we had a mayor a week. 
coming in. Of course, there's preparation, sign up, and sign MOU to share ideas, which we did with the city. But I had, you know, 200 person staff over there, and then half of them were out giving tours. We have already exported the city model to Ecuador three years ago. Other countries, like Yemen and Vietnam, are also interested in importing it. And we're currently in negotiations. Both the South Koreans and the Americans expressed their willingness to export their green city kit model and the Chinese municipalities appear very interested. Near Shangsha, where Mao grew up, the new city of Meishi Lake is emerging, directly inspired by Songdo. But this center for business is five times the size, and it won't be home to 65,000 inhabitants, but to 500,000. As in South Korea, the master plan was designed by the New York-based Gale and KPF. Our work at the Meishi Lake was learning from this new Songdo city example and took a leap quite a bit further in terms of environmental planning, landscape planning, transport, etc. There is a lake that ironically had been drained by Mao Zedong in order to create farmland. Now we're making it back into a lake again. But part of the reason for that is there's tremendous flooding in, in this area every year, which is uh, really, really damaging and the kind of water remediating reservoir created by this lake is of great, great benefit. But then the lake is, as a kind of water transport uh, center, a kind of a transport ground where ferries and boats can crisscross from point A to point B to point C across the lake. Everybody should be able to go to work by water taxi. We're working now in 25 major cities in China, and I can see the importance of, of this exercise in Meishi Lake is tremendous. New cities could indeed serve as a model to respond to the ecological crisis and the explosion of the urban population in some countries like China. But what is the impact of these experimental, ultra-connected cities on the way of life of the city dwellers? I sometimes think we are too dependent on machines. But life has become a little simpler. All these little details like using the same pass to get out of the parking lot, to enter your house, to use the equipment downstairs in the fitness center, to play golf, to use the sauna or the library, everything. When you use this pass, all the data is recorded. What I did, the service I used, everything is recorded. And you can see it all here. That's a surveillance camera screen. Even in the evenings, thanks to the street lighting, we can see the children playing. And we can see all the play areas in the residence. In Songdo, security is a real obsession. The inhabitants watch, and they are watched, constantly. Thousands of cameras watch the city and its inhabitants 24-7. Of course, the drawback is that I'm constantly being filmed. But because I have children, their private lives aren't very... Uh, of course, their private life is important, but their safety is more important than their private lives, I think. I think the feeling of being protected is more powerful than that of being watched. Everything is recorded, who went out and when. So it's impossible to be unfaithful. <laughs> Cameras will soon become intelligent. We already have cameras that we call shot putter that can detect a sound and say that sound is a rifle or a gun or it's a shotgun or it's a bomb or it's just a car backfiring. So based on that, the moment it assumes it's not a car that is backfiring, all the cameras will zoom to where the sound is and then that image and the picture will go to the appropriate security places uh, in a very timely manner.
The new cities are a dream for some, but for others, they are an Orwellian nightmare, with Big Brother threatening the private lives of citizens and their individual freedoms. China is constructing dozens of new cities and is starting to create huge control centers like the one in Songdo. There are a huge number of surveillance cameras on every intersection and every section of road. It's the government who wanted and who designed that. Such a big control system has a large amount of data, of raw data. We have to transfer all the data gathered here to our data center. Then in the future we can manage it and keep it safe. This data will provide the base for smart systems. That's why we need to ensure maximum security for it. Some personal data has leaked in the past, so the right to access images has become very strictly controlled. Only authorized people can access it. Moreover, every time someone accesses it, it is recorded and archived in real time. So everything is done to prevent as much as possible any illegal or undesired personal data leaks. In the end, I think the system is good and bad, depending on who is using it. Almost any technology can be misused. There's always a danger that the camera that is there to protect the, 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 the lives of citizens, the camera that you put on the highways for monitoring traffic management, the cameras that you're putting in at, at, at toll booths, can also, that same data can be used for monitoring whether you're going here, you're going there, and a government can spy on you the government can use your data for controlling you if you're going against the government. Then the question really is, you know, to whom is that government accountable? So we are, when we enter the zone of very powerful systems, we immediately enter the zone of their governance. You see, and, and then, you know, a powerful government can be truly a destructive force. We know that. And with enormous amount of legitimacy, whereas a firm can be exposed as breaking the law. It's very difficult to expose a government as breaking the law. Governments are breaking the law continuously in the name of our security. I wouldn't say that big data is big brother, is adversary, but I would say that we need to be very careful about how we use the data and you know, who has access to it and how we can use it for the public good and not for the good of just few. You can think about systems where you know people have control of their own data and they can make decisions about when they want to share it and to whom, with whom, they want to share it. Can new cities, which are constructed around an information system, become anything other than experiments or technological showrooms? Can they resist the test of time and one day become real cities, vibrant and diverse? I think one thing that Songdo is lacking is, uh, is looking natural. If you see the buildings here and everything is just so well planned and so like structured. So it, it's like a lacking some kind of spontaneous creativities. So I hope that you know, Song, in some future Songdo will encourage this uh, like organic growth or some kind of spontaneous creativity environment. One very common image that we have of these intelligent cities is that uh, they sanitized, everything is perfect. That's a collection of perfectly uh, standing buildings. That is not cityness. What is lacking is disorder, the unforeseen, friction and differences. What gives cities their spice? I think that Fairly quickly, we will have the overwhelming feedback that these cities are, well, pretty fucking boring. I think that will be the key to transforming new cities into real cities or into deserts. These are cities for well-off people with no financial problems. They are extremely homogenous, and the consequence of such homogeneity is they will have to be closed off. They will need to be protected from everyone else, not just because they are dangerous, bad people, but because by definition the others, those outside, have not come to this place with the same mindset, the same desires and the same culture. Therefore, they will upset the lovely order of the place. They'll come with their big cars, while everyone is meant to be driving a hybrid. The majority of these cities, almost all of them, are enclaves. In 
In China, near Shangsha, one mega-rich businessman is pushing the enclave idea even further. He is planning to construct a city in a tower. He is fond of all things grandiose, having already constructed an Egyptian pyramid on his company premises and a French-style chateau with a ballroom copied from that at Versailles. Now he wants to construct the highest tower in the world, called Sky City, 838 meters high, with 220 floors, a city tower where some 300,000 people could live and work. It would have more than 4,000 apartments, more than 200 hotel rooms, over 100,000 square meters of medical and educational structures, more than 10,000 square meters of interior gardens. Its main benefit is that it will save a great deal of space. We are reducing the urban space per inhabitant by 100 times. Secondly, in terms of daily life and work in this building, we hope the elevators will totally resolve the problem of traffic jams. We hope to be able to create them in China, India and other developing countries to offer a better living environment. In July 2013, the first stone of Sky City was officially laid. But a short time afterwards, construction was stopped. A lot of people were concerned about the solidity of this city tower, where urban dwellers would live like human termites. Some futuristic cities will remain a virgin territory. However, many others have yet to be invented.